Okay. So I have the syllabus up here for STAT 23, just to indicate what we'll do today and what I've posted. Uh, first of all, I posted the um, next assignment, which is due on 12.2, and that's to take the S3 class you did and incorporate it into, a, into a R package. I sort of warned you that I was going to do this. And so we'll take a look at that in a minute. I haven't, uh, there's only a little bit here. I, I'll post these, but it just went through some simple things like search and some other functions. But I, I, will, uh, I will post those notes um, when I get a chance, but it's in the book, and again, there's not that much that's, um, there's not that much that's um, there, but I'll, I'll go ahead and post it at any rate. And last time we were talking about um, sections 4, 5, and 6 in Chapter 5, and which dealt with biological sequences, and I'm, I may... Um, I may comment on, on that today uh, a little bit. And then what I decided to do when I looked at chapter um, when I looked at chapter eight, which deals with data manipula manipulation, and again, um, they've sort of skipped over some of the very basic ideas of data manipulation. And so uh, I had used one other remember that I did that wheat example, and that came from the book by Paul Morell called Data Technologies, and that was section 9.9 .9 in that book. Not this book, but another book called Data Technologies by Paul Morell. It's by, I, think it's, I think both of these books are by CRC Press, but um, of the two, Paul Morell writes a lot better than Robert Gentleman, but at any rate. Uh, uh, so I, I think it's important... Um, I think it's important to know data manipulation, and we've learned a little bit about manipulation in R, but I want to go into more detail today and may spill over to next time. So uh, there will be one more assignment. Now this one is due, um, uh, that's Tuesday after Thanksgiving uh, break. Uh, by the, whenever I say a date, that means midnight by that date. but. So it doesn't have to be by class time or anything. There will be one more assignment that I'll be posting, which will cover some of the material in Chapter 5. And, um, well, we'll cover some of the material you know, dealing with regular expressions and character data, uh, text data in Chapter 5, as well as some items from Chapter uh, 8. But I felt, as I mentioned, that um, this particular section and Paul Morell's book is a lot better at doing data manipulation than what is done in Chapter 8. Now, Chapter 8 does have some things uh, that are specific to um, bioconductor and, and to computational biology, but um, we'll get into some of that. One of the things I'm finding is, uh, which we found out last time, in fact, is that some of the things are broken and some of the functions are deprecated, for example, and unfortunately, um, Robert Gentleman has not sort of posted updates to how you might do it. So, for example, um, it's, it's, I suppose one of the flaws of a print book is you only print it every once in a while. Sometimes they never get reprinted. And over time, if you don't change the print book, Certainly in an environment like Bioconductor and R, where you have new functions coming in, you have deprecated functions, you even have functions removed. Deprecated means that it's going to be removed. But they, the first step usually, instead of just removing it, is you deprecate a function. That's sort of a warning that this isn't going to stick around for a whole lot longer. And so one of the key functions that we were using for alignment of sequences is deprecated, the one he uses in the book. Um, unfortunately... Uh, the replacement, there's not much documentation on it, so that, that's where we run into problems. So at any rate, I want to talk just a little bit about, um, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, uh, the next homework, and, um, and then I'll say a few words about this, but I, I may come back to this if I, I want to show you what the replacement function I'm trying to use is. And there were some other problems that I did figure out, 
in terms of just reading the data and you couldn't because they changed the structure of the data. So you actually had to go in and look at the data in the Unix, within the Unix environment. And then you could sort of figure out how you change how you read the data in. So um, it's not entirely Robert Gentleman's fault, but I'm not blaming him for that. What I'm blaming him is that he could post the changes on his website associated with the book. That's what I think should be done. Okay, so this is sort of the gist of things. Um, so let me, first of all, let me go in. Let me go in and um, I'm going to take a look. This is going to be in Dropbox. I, I have different stuff in different places. So assignment four. Let's just sort of go through this, and I'm just going to run this. I'm just going to run this locally, not on the server. Uh, so I will go through and, and nip this, and we can look at the assignment. So here is the assignment. And so um, you're going to use R command build. I, I'm basically going to want the R command build. Um, the file created from R command build, you should submit it along with the PD, PDF. I don't want just a PDF output. Um, in fact, uh, I'm probably going to want the oneway.r package or the, if you take the code that you created in the um, assignment when you did the S3 classes, and if you put all that code in one file called oneway.r, uh, which has all the different functions you created, then that's sort of the starting point you can start with here. Um, and that would be all the code from your S3 assignment. So you put that in a file. If it's not already in a file called One Way Disorder, then you should put it there. And that's going to be the starting point. And then you're going to use the package.skeleton. That function creates sort of a template that has the different directories you need, and it actually creates the fundamentals of this package. But then you have to go in and edit the description file, and you have to create a documentation file, and so forth. So once you do the skeleton pack, that's the initial version. And again, that's in the S. S3 classes develop an assignment two, I guess it was. And then uh, you're going to edit the description file to put the information in. That's just a text file. And you're going to edit relative to your name and your email address. You're the author of this now. Okay. And then we develop uh, we develop a um, a file called oneway.rd, which contains the help information for all of the functions in oneway.r. Again, if you look at, um, either if you look at what I did, or if you look at uh, Frederick Leach's uh, notes, you can sort of get an idea of how to, how to do that. Uh, and that file should be placed in a subdirectory called man. And that man directly, I think, will be automatically created for you when you run the skeleton function. And then, um, now this is one thing we have not done. Um, in other words, how do we create, if we take a data set that we read into R, um, then how do we create what's called a, uh, what's, what's called a, um, well, we're going to need a help file, but we also want what's called a .rda file. And that take, what it does, if you read a file in, however you get it in, um, in this case, you actually could say the, the coagulation data set came from Faraway, so you could say library Faraway data data co coagulation. So that that actually uh, that actually gives you a data frame. So the way that you can create it is you simply say save, and you have the name of the data frame, and you put a comma, and you say file equals, and then you I'm pretty much telling you how to do it here, and then you put in quotes. Now, the first argument, coagulation, is not in quotes. That's a symbol. That is an R object. So you have like save, R object, which is coagulation, comma, file equals, and then you put in quotes the name of the file you're going to generate, which um, is going to be a .rda. So it's like coagulation.rda, uh, which is in quotes. 
and that will create an external file. So when I did this, for example, um, where did I have it? So if you look in here, this file right here was actually created that way. So the key is, if you look at the help, if you go in and look at, uh, I'll show you in a minute, because it, you could, it could be a little confusing to you. If you go in and do a help on save, so if you go in and look at save, it says save is in base R, although there are lots of other saves. And so uh, the way you're going to do this is you're going to have um, you're going to have an R object. So the dot 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 the dot 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 means the name of the objects to be saved as a symbol, not in quotes. In other words, it's an R object. In this case, it's going to be any. You could actually have more than one, but it's it's going to be in our case a data frame. So that dot 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 gets replaced by the object you're trying to save. Now you can save any kind of object. It doesn't have to be a data frame. That's the nice thing about this. Any R object you could save to an external file. And what is, you have to name, if you're going to save it to an external file, you have to tell what it is. And so that's what this command is, is right here, file equals. And if you don't put the external file, it will say stop. File must be specified. So, uh, so you're going to specify the external file. And the extension basically tells you the format. So if it's .rda, it tells you um, that it's R documentation type format. Or it's going to be read back in. You can read this back in. So um, in other words, we can use the data. You can use the data function. Remember when I said data coagulation? That knows how to read a .rda file, the, the function data. So again, if you... If you look right here where I said data coagulation, well, coagulation is in the package fairway. As a matter of fact, um, you know, it's, it's going to, there'll be presumably there's documentation for it. So, you know, you should be able to, you know, to look it up. Now, I don't know if you can get it directly here or whether we may have to C-O-A-G. C-O-A-G-U-L-A, coagulation. Okay. So therefore it says, it's using namespaces. So it's got fairway colon colon coagulation. So that coagulation file is namespace to, it means that that package is publishes externally to us that we can use. And, and so if we look at it, it will give the dot, the, so you're going to kind of re reproduce this type of thing? So if you're going to do this in your package, if you see what I'm saying. So that, you're going to create the descriptive file, the documentation file for coagulation. So in other words, I'm expecting it to be tied to your package. Now, beyond this, um, the, but number five says, let me run this again. Number five said to uh, develop a help file for co coagulation, uh, called coagulation.rd. .rd means R documentation, uh, which contains the help information for coagulation data set. And this should be placed in the man subdirectory. So I'm telling you what to do. You just have to do it. Uh, and then you build the command, and this is where you hope you don't have an error and have to debug, but uh, you're going to do an R command build. Now, this is done from the Unix command line. In other words, within our studio, you're going to have to bring up, if you're using the server, you're going to have to bring up the console. And I'll, and I'll show you, um, and so you have to learn, I mean, it's a tiny bit of Unix. Um, and then I'm going to want you to look at um, Show the output from um, these files using library one way, help one way, et cetera, help coagulation. And so you're going to do all that, and then you're going to illustrate this. 
you're going to illustrate this completely. Uh, you're going to illustrate all the outputs. So you're going in an example file. You're going to put all the code that actually illustrates everything. Okay. So take a look at that, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. But uh, that's um, that's the next assignment. This is actually easier than this, than the assignment with the S3 classes. It's more prescriptive. That's assuming that you got your S3 to work. So, so you should sort of work on it to try. Um, I've been just trying to keep up the courses, but I will get caught up on on the S3 and S4 classes. Uh, hopefully, uh, this weekend time frame. So that's the next assignment. And as I mentioned, your final assignment will be on text data combined with some data manipulation uh, that we're sort of doing today in the next few days. That'll be combined into one assignment. Any questions? OK, I'm going to quit out of here. I'm, this is running locally. And I want to I want to briefly I want to look briefly at this sections four, five, and six. I just want to I wanted to show you a little bit, and I may come back to this, particularly in regard to doing alignment. So I may try to find some examples, and I may have to use examples that are different than the one he's using. So let's go into our studio. And we're going to courses 523, notes. And so first of all, I'm going to briefly look here. But I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I'm going to look at um, chapter 5, section 4. But that actually has sections 4, 5, and 6, I believe. And I'll set the working directory to that. Now. If you try to run this, you'll find out that there are some errors. Some of these actually take a while. This is maybe not a good idea. Some of these are computationally intensive, particularly, are some of you doing it too? We're running off the same machine. so. <clears throat> But not all of these will work correctly. Uh, yeah, there we go. We were talking about palindromes like Madame, where you spell it either way, you get the same thing. This is what we were doing. This is what we were doing last time. <clears throat> and um, the more general thing, instead of looking for the word madam, where you have M-A-D-A-M, where you reverse it and you still get M-A-D-A-M, uh, a lot of times what you have is a sequence, and then this middle part, and another sequence. And it's what's called the left and the right arm of the sequence. And you want to know whether they're the same, or perhaps some function of Perhaps the right arm is some function of the left arm. It might be the reverse complement, for example. Uh, so, um, so you're looking for these these types of patterns, and um, I think I'm not going to go over that again. Uh, I started doing that last time. I don't think I want to go over it. I wanted to go over alignment, however, and <clears throat> I, I do want to show you um, um, the problem is is this function right here. That function is deprecated, and that's the current function. When he was writing this book, that was that was uh, what was used to do sequence alignment. So you might want to know why do you want to do sequence? Why, if you have two genomic sequences, why do you want to compare them and see how similar they are or different? Well, if you think about you know if you think about evolutionary history of a particular species, so you have a species, and it has an ancestor species, and it has an ancestor species, and so on up. And so you might want to track back, because what you're trying to track on a given species, that's your target species, is what were the mutations, what were the, if 
you look at letters of the alphabet being inserted, insertions or deletions, so you could have you could have certain nucleotides deleted or inserted, or you could have a mutation. And so if you look at your parent, the parent species of a species, the two sequences might be quite similar. Uh, there may be just a relatively few difference. So they may be 99.99% the same, but yet you have some mutations that cause those, those, the ancestor to be different than the child species. But as you go up the tree, the, you'll start getting diver, you know, and then it's branching off as species diverge. Then as you go up the tree, you follow a particular path up the tree. It's like with you, you know, you can look at the path. Okay, you have, you have a mother and a father. So you take, take your mother. Okay, your mother has, you know, a mother and father. And, they, and then each of those have a mother and father. So if you go up that particular tree, um, then um, there are many ways you could go up the tree. Um, but at any rate, so you could compare your genetic code with, say, your if you had a sample, you could compare it to your great, great, great grandmother or whatever. And you could compare your genome with her genome to see how similar you are. But that also works with species, of course. So, um, so that's why you might do this. So, if you, um, so the idea was that. Let's see where where are we? It's five six. It's five six four. So, if I do a search for five dot six dot four, I should be able to find it. Yeah. Okay. So, so at any rate, um, if we take a particular string with a particular alphabet and I get that, and I get this, and then I'm going to run this. Th this is named after two men. Um, I forget their name, Needham and someone else. This was run after two men, this particular algorithm for how do you align sequences. You know, it's, it's really the case that we as humans have a very similar genome, but we, we're not all the same. If we were, we'd all look exactly alike and so forth. Besides the fact that you have sex chromosomes, which are different between gender, um, we have um, not only mutations, but um, there are SNPs, so there are differences that arise, um, genetic variation among us. A distinction of a species is, uh, is can you interbreed? So you have a species A and species B, and I don't know if that's an exact definition, but generally speaking, you say that if you're in the same species, you can breed, but if you're in two different species, you can't. I don't know if that's exactly true, but, uh, but basically, um, genetically, two individuals differ slightly, but you might be surprised how little we differ at the genetic level. At any rate, if I run this algorithm, it will run, but it, it complains. Um, and so therefore, when it did the it gives a certain score for how similar these two particular sequences are. Um, and we allowed, remember I said there was a, a, a left, there's a gap in the middle and then a right, and we said, here we say the gap can be up to three, up to three nucleotides long, or in this case these may be amino acids. Um, now if I increase that up to eight, I would expect to find, um, you know, if I increase it up to eight, um, I can have a larger gap. Um, in this case, I have a score of 17 of how similar they are. Now, we have a, co a course at the 700 level, um, which I should look at that book and actually see how he does it. But we have a book um, at the 700 level on bioinformatics, which more theoretically looks at these models. Uh, the probability theory behind it, and a lot of it's uh, Markov, Markov models or stochastic processes. So we have a 763, and we tend to alternate the 763 with the 700 level course for this bioinformatics, which I think is 765. So we alternate those courses because they actually both cover stochastic processes and Markov models. But the bioinformatics course we have um, does that in the context. As, you know, sequences and things like that. Now, uh, those, that course does not get into a lot of stuff like microarray data analysis or expression data for high-throughput experiments. You know, we do that in, in 543. 
uh, where, where we do that. By the way, we've added an undergraduate version of the 543 called 443. It's sort of like discourse, but it's an undergraduate version and a graduate version. That's because we're developing a computational biology undergraduate program, which is joint between biology, math, and stat. And that's why we're developing these two 400-level courses. One's called computational genomics. The 443 is called computational genomics. At any rate, um, the problem is, is that function is deprecated. Um, now, in order to actually do alignment, whether it's DNA alignment or uh, protein alignment or amino acids, um, I'm going to set the system. We have a there's a package called Bioscreams, and it has this data. It has this data called. Um, external data, or ext data. And if I run this command, and then I look at old D. Now, um, that's not what I wanted. That's not going to cut it. Why is that not? It's set working directory. Oh, there it is. Uh, no. Um, that's, whoops. Ooh, I didn't mean to do that. Well, that's like, okay, I could do that. Yeah, I don't know why it came through wrong the first time, but that, that's where it is. So you might, you might want to ask, uh, you know, where, you know, where, where is this? Uh, where is this data? Well, if you actually sort of copy this, I think we should be able to switch to this. So I'm going to copy that, and then I'm going to go up here to where it says I want a shell, and then I'm going to CD. I'm going to try to CD to that directory, uh, and I'm going to paste it, and then I'm going to CD. Now if I do an LS, you'll see that these two files right here are the two files that we're dealing with um, well, you can't. See, well, you can sort of see. You can sort of see this. Now, there were a couple problems. Those two commands. If you look at what's in the book, and maybe it's actually the notes that you download, they had a command called read faster. R E A D, and then in caps, all caps, F A S T A. That command no longer exists. You have to change it to a command called read dot faster with small letters. Now, there's another problem. If I wanted to see what the internal structure of that looks like, uh, I could use there's a Unix there's, a, there's an R command called cat, but there's also a Unix command called cat. In fact, a lot of R commands come from Unix. But so I could sort of say, okay, what's in this? Sc.fa. So I could look at it, and whoops, yeah. So there's actually a name, and then there's this um, DNA stuff these nucleotide strings. Okay. So what I really want is the nucleotide strings. And so, uh, now unfortunately, this is kind of, t I can't get rid of that window <laughs> without closing it. Um, now, just suffice it to say, the other file looks similar. So if I, uh, that's sp.fa. So if, if I hit the up character, SP dot what? FA? Yeah, that's what it looks like. That's what it, so this is the uh, DNA sequence data. So uh, if, you, if you actually looked at the, I have to close this. If you actually look at the way this was originally read in, it didn't work at all. It had like, it, it acted like it was a list. And so it was sort of drilling down into the list to find the data. Well, the data no longer is a list. And so um, I changed the code. I said read dot faster. That's different. But I had to do two things. I had to. I I said read. I said I took the file and I put a dollar sign and then I put that name, and I put this name and notice that it has quotes on it, and then I say collapse, because what would happen? What was happening is if you read it without the collapse. It was all, every, every nucleotide had quotes around it. 
So I want it to be one long string. And so I put collapse equals quotes with nothing in them. So I'm going to collapse it. And hopefully this will still work. So if I run this and I run this, and well, I can do this. Uh, but at any rate, now if I look at SC, uh, I forget. This could be an issue. Yeah. So now it's all run together in one string. So now I have one string. And then if I do the same thing for SP, again, it's all run together. Now the question is, if I compare those two strings, that's not something you'd like to do by hand. Um, what you need is a way of comparing those two DNA strings and see how similar they are. And also you want some sort of scoring algorithm that tells you how similar they are. Now, that, six, that 765 course actually goes into the theory behind it and exactly how you construct these score, th scoring algorithms and so forth. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, they have changed. Um, yeah, basically, we're trying to create this sort of comparison matrix. And if we run this, um, we can put in we're taking a matrix with four rows and four columns. That's because we have four letters of the alphabet. And um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to sort of fill this in with some starting values. I'm going to name these um, the DNA alphabet, which are the four letters. The DNA underscore alphabet are the four letters of the DNA alphabet. And then if we look at matrix, so what this does is it's giving me this substitution matrix and that's, those minus fives are basically a penalty. Um, that if, I, if it's A and I say it's A, there's no penalty. But, but if it's A and I say it's C, there's a minus five penalty and so forth. So this is like a penalty matrix. Now, what we, what I, what we need, this was the old command here, this, this need one uh, algorithm. It, does not, it doesn't even work here. It's not a question of being deprecated. It simply does not work. So what I was playing around with was this. The way you can now do sequence alignment, there are various ways you can do it, but the pairways alignment with a capital A is a function that lets you compare those two sequences. And it comes up with a score, which depends upon how different they are. As I said, in this case, uh, I've got going from A to C as a minus 5 penalty if there's a flip from an A to a C. But everything is a minus 5 penalty. That may not... That's probably not what you want to do, but that's sort of the idea. So uh, at any rate, um, I may play. That's putting in the matrix is the penalization ma matrix. But well, that's what you would do here. But the question is, what do you do here? So if you do this, um, um, let's see what. I, 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 th this is ignoring the penalization. I didn't put matrix in there. So this is just. I'm just putting the two sequences in, and I, I forget what it does, but it's not really what you want to do. Um, but the line one. So this is giving a very, very high score. And so the problem is um, this is looking at the two patterns, and this is a high score. But again, I was just using defaults. I wasn't putting a particular penalization matrix. Uh, the problem is this book doesn't really tell you how to construct it. You'd have to go to that more advanced course to see how you might do that. Um, but the idea is that you have some sort of penalty matrix of, if you say, you know, if you say it's an A and it's really a C, how much do you get penalized? Or if it's a C, it's a C. typically it would be symmetric. Probably the penalty going from A to a C would be the same as going from a C to an A. But, um, but you know, so at any rate, that, that's the idea of how you do this. Um, and that, that actually runs, but it's not realistic and because you really want some sort of scoring matrix in here. So I didn't have time to play with that, but you know I may come back with that. But that's the idea uh, when you do sequence alignment. Now, this function lets you do something else. It lets you take a whole bunch of sequences and compare them to a target. So I may take, uh, you may take all your relatives and get, if you had the DNA with your relatives, you could actually compare them to you. And you can see how different you are from each one of them. Uh, so um, where that tr works true for species. So if I have a particular species and I'm looking at how it compares to ancestral species, then I could do the same thing. So at any rate, does anyone have any questions on that? So that species alignment is um, 
um, I've sort of commented out, commented out of this, um, and I will, um, I may come back to this just a little bit if I, uh, I need to do some reading in that other book to see how you might construct it. Uh, unfortunately, um, ideally the people who write these packages, there's one thing I haven't told you about, is that you can write a, a document that's called a vignette. And a vignette for a package illustrates part of what that package does. So a given package, but generally they're supposed to be short, so they don't illustrate the whole package necessarily. You may have five or six different vignettes for a given package. You know, one package illustrates some ideas, another one, I mean, one vignette illustrates some ideas, another one. But uh, in order to write the vignette, you do have to know LaTeX. So it's, it's not R markdown, so it's harder to write. So I didn't make that as an assignment. But if you write a package, you really should write vignettes that explain how to use your package. Because what you will get out of the package is a documentation file. But the documentation file simply says, here's a function, here are the arguments. You see, when you do a help, that's what you get. You get, here's a function, these are the arguments, and then it explains each argument, then it has a few. It, if it's good, it will have some examples like I asked you to do and it will have some explanation. But a vignette should sort of be able to step you through exactly what, what the package does, or at least one component of the package. And uh, you can extract, from a vignette, you can extract the code and execute it. So at any rate, uh, and you can publish those, um, when you publish those, then in the description file, you often tell people what the vignettes are that you can download and, and run to illustrate what you're doing. So if you really do a good job on a package, you should have vignettes, not just a documentation file. The documentation file is your first step, but if you really, like in this particular case, if you, if you, go, if you go to, um, it, I guarantee you, if you go to p this function right here, pairwise alignment, and you read the documentation files, that's not going to help you all that much to figure out how to use this function. It's a very complex function. And it gives you lots of options for how you can compare sequences. But it doesn't explain them biologically. It, it just says, OK, here's an example of how we do it. And it's not, you're not going to get very far. F f you know, you're going to need to do a lot more than just that. So are there any questions? So I'll probably come back to this a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> So now the, the third topic I want to cover today is this uh, section 9.8 from the book called Data T Technologies by Paul Morell. And so um, I'm going to go back um, to notes. And if I go into chapter 8, this stuff right here follows the book. Um, it's not complete yet. This is section 1 of the book, and this is section 5, but these are not complete. What I want to do today, I will work on them, but they're not complete at this point. Uh, this is actually um, um, the ITDT stands for Introduction to Data Technologies, and the 9.8 means Chapter 9, Section 8. So if you look at that book, this is Chapter, um, this is uh, Section 8 of Chapter 9 in the book called Data Technologies by Paul Morell. So if I bring this up, if I bring this up, and um, I think what I'm going to do is sort of, I, I'm going to sort of, well, first of all, I want to make sure that I set the working directory correctly. And so what I'm going to do is sort of uh, go, go through uh, data manipulation. We could, could call it data management in R. We've done a little bit of data management in R, but we've kind of uh, fluffed over some of, the, uh, some of the topics. And so we're going to go through some additional things. Let's see how we're doing time-wise. Okay, 139. 215? Okay. Okay, so um, there's a data set uh, called schools.cbs. And just so that we can sort of get an idea of what this looks like, so if I go down and type in schools, um, this is what the data looks like. These are schools in New Zealand. Turns out New Zealand has a lot of really small schools. It's very spread out. I mean, there, there's Auckland and Wellington and Christchurch. There's a few places that aren't small, but there's a lot of really small towns. 
And so there are a lot of really small schools. And so the first column is the ID for a school. And then the second is the name of the school, which is character data. But it's not going to be a factor. It's character data that's descriptive of the school, but it's not a factor. And then the city that it's from, and of course you could have multiple schools from a given city, and city might be stretching it for some of these places. Um, and then um, <clears throat> the authorization has to do with, is it state supported, is it private, and so forth. There, I think there are four categories. One is sort of a hybrid of state and private. Um, and then the DEC stands for decile. They rank these schools, and so they're talking about the 10 deciles of the ranking of the school. And then uh, row is the enrollment of the school. Okay, so that's what the data, so the first row actually represents the headers, and then it starts with the data. So if we look, if we look at the code for reading this in, um, I'm going to read in, I'm going to read dot, dot CSV. Well, what does CSV mean? Well, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to click on it. Um, Notice that all the fields are separated by comma. So CSV is comma-separated values. Uh, so, we're, so it's a comma-separated va value file. And so I'm going to use the R function read.csv, which creates a data frame. So I'm going to read schools.csv, header equals true. What does the as is equal to mean? It means the second column is going to be read as is, because what by default, do you know what R does by default if it creates a data frame when you read it in this way, and it's character? By default, it converts it to a factor. That's nice, but I don't want the names of the schools to be a factor. They're descriptive. So I say as is equals two. So this second position, that is not going to be coerced to a factor. So that's what the as is does. So um, if I read schools in, and I look at the dimension of it, you can see that, <clears throat> maybe if I do this, it will come up. You can see that there are 2,571 schools, and there are six columns representing the six variables. And I'll print out the first six by doing the head command. So those are the first six. So the ID, the name, the city, and the authorization, it's state one of the four, the decile, and the enrollment. So we're unclear. So we read that in. Now, <clears throat> if you're in Excel, um, what people often do is they have the data here, and they kind of surround it by metadata, various summaries. So what you have to do is sort of pull out that middle piece, because that's what you're interested in. A lot of time, they have it in what I call wide format. And you have to take wide format and convert it to long format, which I'll show you how to do later today or on Wednesday if we don't get to it today. Um, a lot of times, you have to convert to what's called, suppose you have like, uh, you have repeated measurements on the same unit. And so you, instead of having them here, here, and here, vertically, you have them horizontally, those three measurements. And usually in STAT, we have to have them vertical, not horizontal. Depends on the model we're using. Uh, if we're doing a multivariate model, it may be fine to have them horizontal. But if we're doing a univariate model, we usually have to have it vertical. <clears throat> so we're going to be looking at methods to convert what we call wide format data to long format data, which is what I'm calling horizontal and vertical. <clears throat> So we have the data in. Now we might want to do something simple, like what's the median enrollment? <clears throat> what is the median enrollment? Now the median is often a very good measure. For example, um, a lot of times you have this misconception about how wealthy people are if you get the mean of their wealth, because that's skewed by the very rich. Did you know that the top, I read, heard this last night, you probably knew this, the top 400 richest Americans have as much wealth as the bottom 50%. So if you take the mean, if you, this was on 60 Minutes where Warren Buffett's trying to get all the rich people to donate at least half of their income to charity. So, so far 109 out of the 400 have, and he's one of them. 
At any rate, um, if I'm looking at the median, this will be the median of all enrollments for all schools, irrespective of the authority. So that's the, by putting quotes around the argument, it actually not only assigns it to role median, but it actually prints it out. And so you see that it's 193. So a lot of these schools are not too big, but it's, 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 it's more than that. Now, <clears throat> if I now say, we, we have done if statements, um, <clears throat> and I think we did the if else. Uh, so we say if, at, if else test uh, equals school dollar enrollment is greater than the medium enrollment, then it's yes, otherwise it's, not, it, then it's large, I'm sorry, otherwise it's small. So if we compare the enrollment of every school, and if it's greater than the median enrollment, then if that's true, then this is the true clause, then we say large, and if it's not true, then we say small. So if we look at the size, and this is for the 2,500 and some schools, if we look at the size, I now have the size, and if I look at the first 14, this is the first 14, large, 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 small, small. There are going to be half of them that are small and half are large, right? Roughly, I mean. Um, <clears throat> well, I say that because if you have an odd, if you have, if you had nine schools, you're going to have five and four. Okay, not. If you have eight, you four and four. Um, <clears throat> so suppose, um, suppose I wanted to create a new column called size. Uh, I can do that by saying schools, which is a data frame, dollar sign size, gets size. And so I can actually create a new column. And now if I print out the head now, notice I have another, compare this to this. There's a new, there's a new variable tacked on at the end called size. And so this is how I did it. It's not the only way to do it, but this is how I, one way to do it. I simply, <clears throat> remember, a data frame is sort of is like a named list where all the elements are the same length. So I can use a dollar sign operator. And here I'm, I'm basically using a replacement where I say school's dollar sign size um, gets size. And, but how do I get rid of, now that I created that column, how do, I get, how do I get rid of it if I wanted to eliminate it? Well, I could just simply say, I could simply say school's dollar sign size gets null, and that actually kills it. So I, if I now do this, and I now print that out, it's gone. Well, that doesn't seem very elegant, but there's another way I can use transform. I can simply say I want to transform the school by um, creating a new variable called size equals size. With, notice one has a capital S. <clears throat> and so I could now do this. And then I could do the, the first six again, and now it's back. Notice that size is capitalized here. It's actually capitalized here, too, because I put a capital, capital S right there. Okay. Now, there's another way. Whoops. There's another way that I could get rid of that. Notice that the size is column number seven. So that's column number seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I can simply subset it where I have a minus seven, and that actually deletes it. And then I could sign it back to schools. So that's another way I could get rid of that seventh column. And now if I say head, well, it's gone again. So we've looked at two ways we could add a column, and we've looked at two ways we could delete a column. Now suppose we wanted to take enrollment and divide it into five categories. So we'd like to divide it uh, sort of equally. We'd like to divide it into five categories, tiny, small, medium, large, and huge. Those are five categories. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take school enrollment and we're going to cut it. This has an algorithm for cutting it into five categories. So basically it ranks them. And I, think, I think this, by default, I think it puts an equal number in each one. So. Um, so I'm going to do this, and I'll run it, and that's rolled si rolled out size. And now, if I look at if I look at rolled out size, um, you can see that there are actually five labels, and the the, the, fir the first uh, the first five are in fact tiny. Uh, if I do a table to see how many each of each of them, um, they're actually 
out of the 2,500 and some, there are actually 2,487 that are tiny. I mean, there are a lot of schools that really have only a few students. And then uh, small is 75, medium is 8, and then there's actually one, only one, that's huge. So this is sort of taking the range of the data and just dividing it equal. But the fact that you take the range of the data and divide it equal doesn't mean you get the same number in each range. So you split it equally, but the number in each range is very different. Are there any questions on what we did? That cut, the cut is very, very useful when you have a cat, when you have a, a when you have a numeric variable and you want to convert it into a factor. So you have a numeric, you might have age and you want to divide it into sort of young, middle age, and senior or whatever. So you want to divide it into three or four or five categories. So a lot of times that happens where you take a numeric variable and you want to convert it into a factor and analyze it that way. <clears throat> Any questions so far? So these are very useful things to be able to do. Um, another very useful thing to be able to do is to sort your data. So how do we sort an R? Um, well, we could take we could take schools dollar signs row and sort it. And here I'm just going to print out the first 12 observations. So this is the first 12 observations a row, but this probably wasn't what you expected. You probably wanted the whole data frame back, and we'll get to that in a minute. But notice, those are the schools that have five students, five students, six students, six. You can see there are some pretty small schools there. Now suppose that I say I want to sort it, but I want to sort from the largest to the smallest instead of the smallest to the largest. Then you simply, there's an option called decreasing equals true, and now when I run this, and I'm going to only do 12 of them, it gives me the highest 12. This is the top 12. See in brackets I say 1 colon 12? That means I'm going to subset just the first 12. But in this case, it would be the 12 largest. And you can see that you have one school that has 5,546. So you've got some pretty good schools, pretty big schools there. But, but you notice there's a jump from 3,000 up to 5,500. So when you split it into five equal intervals, that's why you only had the one. And in fact, you had none that were large because of that really huge one. There, were, there was one there, and there were no large. And now, but you do get a. Um, you can see that you get eight to the medium. But these medium ones are actually fairly big. They're they're in this range here. Okay. Um, well, there's a function, that's sorting, but there's a function called, in order to actually sort the whole data frame, we need a function called order. And the order tells you, well, let me do it and then I'll explain. Uh, I'm going to look at the order of schools dollar signs role, decreasing equals true. So what happens to this? And let's print out the first 12. So what do you think this is telling you? It says, I've got, I've got this data frame that has 2,500 plus rows, right? And it says, if you ask which row, which row has the most enrollment? That row is the 1,726th row, has the highest enrollment. And then the school that has the second highest enrollment is 301 and so forth. So this is telling where are you in your data, the order in the data frame that you are. And this again is decreasing from largest to smallest. So how might you then order the data frame. Suppose I want to take the whole schools and this gives me this gives me row indices, right? What this is doing is giving the order is giving me row indices. And now suppose I want to take the whole data frame and print it out, but in order of decreasing enrollment, I could do that by using the enrollment order. <coughs> Remember that if I have a data frame, I I have the row, comma, column. So what I'm doing is I'm putting this sort order before the comma, and I'm putting nothing after the comma, which means I want all the columns. Do you see that? So I've got brackets after schools. It's OK. I've got the schools data frame, and I'm going to get the sort order, although I'm only going to do the first 12, because I don't want to print out you know, 25. I don't want to print out all the data. 
I, it just sort of scroll by very quickly, but I don't want to do that. So I'm only going to print the first 12, but the comma, and then I have nothing, means I'm going to print all columns. So let's see what happens. So I'm using, I'm using the, I could have embedded this command right here. I could have embedded that directly into this. I wouldn't have had to do this two steps. In other words, order, because this is saved as order and order goes here. I could put, I could put this function directly into here. Do you follow what I'm saying? So instead of doing it in two steps, you can do it in one step. So you embed order as the first subscript within the school. So let's see what this looks like. So what this for the first 12, we can see now that, that 5,546 is the correspondence school in Wellington. I was actually supposed to go to a conference over Thanksgiving in Wellington, but I've canceled out of it. So I wanted to see Wellington, but I'm a little too busy. Sort of that's where the Lord of the Rings and all those movies are. In Wellington. It's because it's kind of become it's become Australia's version of Hollywood, I suppose. So it's a very creative city and it has a major university there, which is where I was gonna be going. At any rate, um, so um, here I put order directly in, and in this case, I'm ordering by city. I'm ordering by t I'm I'm getting order by city and then by enrollment within city, decreasing. And I have one little thing I'm puzzled a little bit about, but okay. So now I run it, and it's doing it by city and then enrollment. So if I look at Winston, for example, notice that the enrollment is decreasing within city. I'm not sure why V why this is before the why V is before the W is but uh, but at any rate um, this is the you could print out all the schools and this is giving I'm now looking at decreasing enrollment within decreasing city. Are there any questions on that? So that, that's how we can sort a data frame. Now you might say that, uh, of course, if you were in jump, you could do this very easily with a point and click. But of course, we need to be able to do this within a programming environment. Um, not just because it's reproducible, because it becomes part of the workflow that you're doing a lot of times. That you need the, if you're doing certain non-parametric statistics, you would need the rank orders. There's a function called rank, too. Now, if I look at the authorization table, I, I can do one-way table, I can do two-way tables. So if I, if I just want to see how many are in each, each, of each type of authorization, then I could print the table. And you can see that there are 2,144 state schools. There are 99 private. I'm not sure what the other is, but there's one other. And then the state, then there's a state integrated, which I think is some sort of combination of some combination of state and private. So, for example, Cornell University is a private school, except its ag school is not. Its vet school and ag school is state supported, but it's a private Ivy League school. But its ag school and its that school is state supported. So that would be an example of an integrated college in the sense that it's mainly private in that case, but partially state supported. So I th it's something like that. If I look at the class, uh, the class of author table is class table. So this gives me a one way table, it gives me a frequency count for each of the categories. Now, um, <clears throat> If I'm look, if suppose I wanted to find out, well, what school is this other school? I could then say uh, authorization equals other. Notice the double equal signs, and um, so if I do that, it tells me this is the school that is other. However, that's defined. It only has an enrollment of 51. Now suppose you want a two-way table, where you're looking at say. Uh, suppose you're looking at 
the decile at the school versus the authorization of the school, the type of school. And so I could do a two-way table. I've simply listed uh, schools dollar sign DEC and schools dollar sign AETH. I've actually assigned names to them, so these will appear on the table. So I can run a table, and that gives me a two-way table of the decile, 1 to 10, and an authorization. So you can see state, the state schools fall fall off. You might ask, are the private schools, you know, are the private schools more likely to be uh, in the higher deciles? And in fact, that appears to be the case. If we look at private, you, you see if the state schools are kind of uniform over here. And, the, uh, and in fact, the integrated schools are pretty much, I mean, there's a little bit of variation, but they're somewhat uniform. But if you notice the private schools, they tend towards the upper deciles. So that uh, there's some indication that the private schools are, in fact, better. However, they're measuring better. Okay. Notice that other one. That other one may have been a certain special type of special education, perhaps, or something like that. It's actually in the lowest decile. It was uh, a Catholic you, school, right? It was. Oh, was it? I, it says Christ Church. Uh, well, Christ Church is the name of the city, oh. and Christ Church is the city. It's. <laughs> It's it's on the southern island, South Island. It's the one that got destroyed by um, the tsunami. It's on the Ring of Fire. Yeah. It got a big earthquake. And I don't know if it was a tidal wave that came in too. But it it was it was widely destroyed actually in Christchurch, so a couple of years ago. I could also do this with X tabs. If I want this two-way table, it's another way to do it. I could actually do the same thing with X tabs. Tilta, that, that, it's like writing a formula with only the right-hand side. There's no left-hand side. So it's tilde DEC plus authorization. So it's like a formula for data equals schools. And that gives me the same table. That's just a, another way of doing it. How are we doing time-wise here? OK, we got a little time. OK. Any questions on that? So these are very useful things to know how to do. I mean, this is very practical stuff that you need to know how to do in R. Uh, that's why I wanted to cover this section, because the book doesn't always do practical things. And, well, I mean, it may be practical. It's just they start out here, not down here. So, <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> so here we're going to learn a little bit about a uh, function called aggre uh, aggregate. And you might guess an aggregate is a w one of the ways we can aggre aggregate information. So I could, if I were looking at enrollment, I could also compute the mean of enrollment. So the mean is uh, 295. Uh, that's actually um, a lot higher than the median. What was the median? Uh, do you remember? Where was the median? Way up here. The median was 193. The mean is 293. Why? Well, you have that one school that's really big. I mean, you've got, you've got a relatively few schools that are really, really big, so it's going to skew the median to, to the right. So the, median, the mean is much larger. It's 295 versus 193. So the mean is much larger than the median. So that, that's the problem with using the mean on income you know, that it skews it. It's like living on an island. If 10 people live on an island and one of them is a millionaire and the rest of them are impoverished. Well, the average salary is not bad. The average salary is almost 100000 So at any rate, you got to be careful. Um, so at any rate, um, what we're going to do, um, if I look at the mean, here I can look at the mean where I'm going to look at where the authorization is private. So if we look at, if I look at the mean, um, now these are just schools that are private, the enrollment. And I'm looking at the mean enrollment for schools that are private. You can see it's a bit higher. But what's really skewing those schools are, they, are those really big ones. Now, I could, 
I could say I want to aggregate schools on row by, and I can put a list here, but in this case there's only one thing in a list, by authorization and the function is mean. Let's just do this and see what we get and then we'll sort of explain. So what we wanted to do here, uh, if you run if you run SAS, for example, there's this by statement. So I want means by something. Well, this is one way. It's not the only way, but this is one way that we can do a by statement. And so I'm going to get the mean enrollment. So I'm going to aggregate using the function mean. Notice there are three arguments here. This, you know, I'm going to look at the enrollment of schools. And I'm going to get the enrollment of the different, different authorizations using the mean function. And so this gives me the mean for each of these. Okay. So here's the 308 that I just did above. That's the 308. But this gives all four of them. Okay, so that's pretty handy to do. That list doesn't have to be just one, you know, uh, just one fact that I'm going across. So suppose I define something called rich. Rich would be that if you're above if you're above the fifth decile. That maybe is an exaggeration, but if if the if you're in if you're above the fifth decile. So if I look at it and if I look at the head, then each school is a true or false. It's de depending on whether it's in the sixth decile or above. And um, if I now look at it. I, if I now look at enrollment, I'm looking at enrollment, and I'm going to get the mean, but I'm going to do it by authorization and whether or not they're rich. So this, so if you look at this, now I get a table that has both ownership and richness. So for each of these, I have false or true. Now notice there is no other in the bottom. Why? There was only one school that was other, and that appeared in the that appeared to be a, that was a not a rich school. Remember, it was in the lower decile, if you remember, and so so that that's why you have seven instead of eight categories here. So for the false, which includes the other, um, that first category actually only has one school, and it was 51, so that's the mean, of course, and so that gives that gives the enrollment by two factors, whether or not you're rich and what the ownership is. Any questions on that? Okay. Now suppose you have range you want suppose you want a summary of the ranges, but the range is, the range has two numbers, minimum and max. So suppose you're doing a range. So I can, if I get the range of schools, this is everything. 5 is the smallest, and 55, 46 is the largest. That's just looking at all schools, the enrollment in all schools. Now suppose I want to, I'm going to use a by statement. And see, here I'm using the by within the context of an aggregate. But I can, do, I can just use by by itself. By school enrollment, and then indices will be, um, will be um, ownership equals authorization, and then I have a function of range. So what I'm going to do is have the range function applied to authorization. Okay. In this case, we use indices. Uh, we're going to name this indices, and we're going to do this over enrollment. So let's take a look at this. And then let's look at its class. It's a class by. And now what's different here? What's different is that it gives the it gives the range 51 51 but it gives it as a list so in other words this is the first element of list the second element so it's actually given a list structure it's not maybe as simple as what you would hope to give uh, so uh, this gives it as a list in this case there's only one school has an element of 51 so the min and the max are both 51, and then and so forth. So there there is a private school that only has seven students in it. So it doesn't tell you what kind of private school, just what it could be a small religious school, for example. 
doesn't tell you what kind of school it is. And the largest private school is 1663, and state and so forth. So that big school is a state school. And so that gives us the information, but it's a list. And that may not be uh, that may not be what you want to do. Okay, I'm trying to decide if I. Okay, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to tell you what we're going to be looking at next when we come back, and I'll give an indication. Of what we're going to read another table, and this table is uh, fairly big. Th this this is what I call wide data. Uh, we have names, and this is, deals with educational data. We have name, and then we have level one, level two, and level three. And this is what I call wide data, because it's got level one, level two, level three. And what you might want to do is make level one, level two, and level three vertical, what we call tall data. And one, so one of the questions might be is, how do I convert wide data to tall data, and how do I convert tall data back to wide data? Uh, believe me, this is something you need to do all the time in statistics. If you have if you have a design that we call a repeated measures design, which I would claim was the most common, either repeated measures or there's a variation on that, where it's maybe not repeated measures, but it's a variation on that. Um, that was probably one of the most common type. You have a treatment, you have subjects of treatment, and then for each subject you measure over time what happens. Very common. So if you've got the time stretched out over columns, that's what I call wide. And it, depending on how you analyze it, if it's multivariate, you can leave it that way. But if you're going to do it like a split plot model or a repeated measures model, you want to do it this way. And so you have to convert it. So this is the data. And so in order to read this data in, we're going to read this as a table. We're going to read this as text. The separator here, you may have noticed that the separator is a colon. So we're going to use, uh, the separator is going to be a colon, and um, we're going, we have a header. So I can read this information in, see how big it, and those are the first 12 values. Let's see how big it is. This is not such a big data set. We're going to read another data set. We're going to manipulate this a little bit. Then we've got another data set that also has the same name of the school, name of the schools, I guess, or colleges. And then we actually have to learn how to merge these two data sets together. So we'll do that next time. So there's, so if you look at uh, if you look at the rest of this, and I have posted this, I posted it, but there's one data set missing, and so you won't be able to do part of it. So I have to repost it. That has uh, there's one more data set which I didn't post, called Baltimore. This data set is not. The last part of that section does this data set, and that data set is not in what I put on the web. I sort of missed it when I posted it. So I'll add that and repost it. But you won't be able to do the last part of this if you want to look through it. Any questions? So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of inf interesting stuff here in this section. And one of the things we're going to be looking at pretty soon are the apply functions. And the apply functions are very, very powerful. And we're also going to be looking at reshaping data. Um, and reshaping data, as I mentioned, is one of the most common things you'll be doing. But the people joke that, you know, you, you, you learn all this statistics, and then you spend 90% of your time doing data management, 10% of the time doing your analysis. Um, and this is often, it's not always true, but it's, uh, unfortunately, it's way too common. And that's partly because the, Partly because the people who compile the data are not the people who analyze it. And the people who compile it have no idea what, how we need it in order to analyze it. And therefore, we have to take their data and reshape it in all sorts of ways. OK, I'll stop here. And we're going to continue on this next time. And then we will go into other aspects of Chapter 8. But we're going to continue on this section next time.